Mr. Mackerel, can you tell me when and why you came to Gary, Indiana? Well, I told you why I came here, but my brother was here. <clears throat> and Remember, you have to include, if you can just say, I came to Gary because my brother, you know what I mean? Yeah. We talked about that before. Yeah, I came. Okay. I, I was say I came to get to get because my brother was yet, and he'd been wanting me to come all the time, and so he kept wanting me to come. But the main reason what made me really come, get my mind to come, is I think I told you before, that uh, we had a cartoon in a paper there called it. I think it was a gay set, Arkansas gay set, and it had a guy in there called Hambone. And he said that uh, I wouldn't tell another mule to get up here. He was sitting in my lap. <laughs> so I thought it was about time to go because things had got kind of tight. What do you mean things had got kind of tight? Can you? Well, uh, you know, we're farming, and naturally, some years, you know, they, maybe they, they come out with the market, the price is going to be good. Then finally, when just by the time you get your crop together, then the, everything falls. Uh, things go down and down. And I think 19 and 20 was one of the bad years. I mean, everything went down so low until the merchants told all of their customers to hold the cotton, they're going to get a dollar a pound. And they held it, and when what happened was then they finally didn't get anything. It finally went down so they, they wouldn't buy it, they wouldn't even look at it. My daddy got caught in that snap. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now. Tell me what year you came up here, and tell me about the trip up here, and what happened when you got here. Well, I come up here in 1927, and uh, well, next to when I got here, I had to try to look for a job. That was the main thing. Uh, and I was pretty lucky. It was quite a few guys was here that supposedly had been looking for a job. I don't know what it was, but I was lucky. A guy carried me out to the <clears throat> mill where they they had a, what we call a bullpen. They had about uh, two, three hundred guys standing over that big fence around it. And the guy had come out, it was named Hagenburger. And he'd look over the crowd, point out somebody, hey, you. And it was a gun guy was looking for a fellow there. He, he, he needed somebody at the real mill. And this guy that had me there, he was a big husky guy, you know. I, I was a little fellow. <laughs> And he come over and asked this guy, was he looking for a job? And this guy said, no, I said, my cousin looked for a job. And he, me, he looked at me and he said, well, he's too light for that thing. And uh, so then he still said, Hagenberg, and he told me, he said, stand over there. And I stood over there, so after he got through, he called about two or three guys, and he started in. I said, that man is gone. And he said, Mr. Hagenberg, he says, go in in there. And that's the way they had it. Didn't, they wasn't... They wasn't um, filling out applications at that time like they do now. <laughs> now, what was your job? What did you do? What was my job? Well, the first thing when I went out there, I was working labor, you know, just pitted around, uh, uh, helping out on the guys that was on the, what they call the restraining, uh, and just laboring around, first one thing and another. Later on, they had a place that was open down on what they call a uh, cold saw, where they saw them rails, cut them off when they was too long or too short or something. They had to cut, recut them and then re-drill re them. And finally, a guy asked me one day, said, if I want to go down there, I said, it'd be more money. I was making $4.40 a day to labor. And those guys were re-straightening re re and that gagger, the re was $25 a day, and the gagger was making 15 I'm making 4 40 <laughs> So I went down there, and he told me it was bonus. I said, what do you mean by bonus? You know, I didn't know what bonus was that time. And so I went down there and taking that job that day. And uh, he couldn't get nobody else still in that job. And it's big husky guys. And those big husky guys would get down there and they just couldn't take it. And I went down there and stuck with it. Mm -hmm. So. Was dragging them reels up to the coal saw. Okay, so describe the work. I mean, was it hot? Was it heavy? Oh, you, I mean, you, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, have to, you have to wait till I get finished. Okay, now, now let's drive the work. Was it hot? I mean, you have to tell me that. Yeah. Describe it. No, way. it wasn't hot where I was at. No, this is over on the, what we call over on the dock. It wasn't hot over there. I wasn't over in the mill part. Well, tell me what the work was like in the mill. 
Oh, well, what I could see the work in the mill was hot. Uh, when them rails would come down, uh, well, they have a big slab, a great big thing, and they run that thing down two or three times. And I guess when they put that big uh, slab in there, it was about, uh, I imagine, about two feet by two foot thick, maybe bigger than that. And probably about, uh, I was about six foot long, maybe something like that. And when they run it through them big rolls, it run way down and back and forth, and when it come out, when it did finish it, it was about, uh, well, I guess about a hundred and some feet long because they cut it up to make about three rails out of it, and the rails were 39 feet. And they make about three rails out of it when it come out, and then they cut it. They had a big saw, they come down on and cut it in two, and they'd make about three 30-foot rails out of one of them rails after they done rolled it out that slab. Now, when we talked before, you talked. You also told me about how difficult the jobs were around the coke ovens and the gas that was in there and the heat, and there was no ventilation. Can you tell me that again? Around the coke coke oven. Yes, sir. I was at the coke oven. No, but you said the other people that were. Yeah, well, when them reels would come down, they had what they call a, a cooling bed. And uh, they'd come up on this bed. Well, those guys over there, then they had to keep them rails turned over so they wouldn't bend up. And they had to go up there between that heat, and it was hot up there. And they had to go up there and turn them over ever so often. And they was red hot and, and, until they cooled down. Because if, if they didn't turn them, they would bend up. They'd just bend up. And that was over in what they call over. That was over in the mill side. Now, uh... It sounds dangerous. Was it, were these dangerous kinds of well, jobs? And what would, I mean, what kind of accidents happened if they were dangerous? Well, I, I don't think it was so much, in, in our department where that was, it wasn't too dangerous I know anything about, because then they had, see, when they get them reels come up there, then they bring them out and they had to, they had to drill them. Uh, they come up, if they cool off enough, then they come up there and drill them, they had, uh, you know, they had certain, Drills they had to put them there so they fit when they put them on the track. Sometimes they missed drill them. Now that's where I was. I was on I was on the dock. Well, when they get one that uh, they probably missed drilled it, then they would come over there and they had to cut it off and re-drill it again. Well, and they pile it up and then we re-drill it and and then inspect it and ship it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's stop for a second. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, what I told you before was that uh, we worked on the hot mill oatmeal floor. Uh, and on the hot mill oatmeal floor, it was mostly black and Greeks worked over there. And we had a pretty good little nucleus of a group at that time. We worked together fine. We used to have our little meetings out in town. And sometimes we'd have a meeting with management because the iron get bad. And when that iron would get real bad, you couldn't make any money because you only got what you made. It was all piecework. And uh, so those was just Greeks. And we, wasn't no promotion for blacks at that time, no kind of promotion. Uh, the only promotion I had when I was working there would be just one step, and that would be up to Sherman, and I couldn't get that. I couldn't get that. Now, when we talked before, you also described to me the kind of problems that you had before the union came in. You talked you talk to me about pay rate and the hours and the shift change story and whatnot. Can you tell me that again, about the problems you had before the union? Yeah, well, the problem we had, as I said before, the problem that we had before the union was that uh, we just wasn't making very much money and there was no promotion for us. That's about the only thing I can tell you now, the same thing. And, uh, well, sometime, as I said before, we, we would have to meet with managers to try to get some consideration. Um, that was a problem we had uh, on the hot wheel open flow. See, we, 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 we didn't, uh, we wasn't in, we wasn't over into the mill part like over in the mill part. Now you take the hot wheel where those rollers roll that iron out. Now that was just, oh, about, a, about like from, from Ford for where we worked at, from here to the back side of the house, or whatever, at the end of the half. That was where the old hot wheel was. Them guys, where they was in that heat. And those rollers, 
uh, had to roll that iron through them, roll backwards and forwards. And I see some of them guys sometime, they face would be just, 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 just raw. And they'd put a cloth over them to try to keep that heat from burning. And then in the summertime, I've seen guys just laying out just like sheep with the rods. They're out there just groaning, taking them to the hospital, aching. You know, they had time. That was from the hot mill, but, I, but that didn't bother us so bad. We weren't over in that part. We weren't in that, but that was the guy on the hot mill. Now, you said that you would meet with Madge. Okay. We've got to change in just a few minutes. This is good. Mm -hmm. Real good. You comfortable? Mm-hmm. Okay. Will you order anything? You know, about the, about the Malcolm 80, see, what happened was uh, they tried to organize the union, but everybody was afraid, especially the whites. They were the rest of scared to, to try to they tried Hawkins tried to organize. He had uh, what they call the old uh, iron sheet and tin mill, tin workers. And, um, but they couldn't do any good. Now, Joe Goins and Johnny Myrick, and Cleo Owens, Arthur Adams, and John Spillers, uh, they had a pretty good nucleus in the big mill. Uh, and when we started organizing, uh, all of we guys, facts at the first, we uh, joined the uh, 1014, uh, because Joe, Joe Gordon had the nucleus, and when they, when, when well, let me, tell, let me go back and give you like this. Uh, when we started setting up, see, Nick Fontacchio, and Leo Swinsky and a guy called Hart were sent in here from the mine workers, John L. Lewis. And I happened to go over there. In well, fact, Jesse Reese had been having me to go over there, carrying him trying to set up one of the little nucleus over there. But I carried him over there for about two years. And nobody was meeting but him and a white fellow and his daughter. And so about one day I told him, I said, Jess, I says, I've been bringing you over here now for about a couple of years, and I don't see nobody here but you, the man, and the daughter. I said, I'm going to come over here and show you how to organize this thing. And he said to me, he said, don't come now. I didn't know what he meant, but what he meant was they was planning at that time to hold a convention. I think that would have been about 1935. And there they were planning to try to get steel workers organized committee set up. And from my understanding was they, they had a big rookers and they kicked out about 10 internationals, the oil workers, uh, the automobile workers, the garment, ladies garment workers, and uh, all of them, they kicked them out. And that's when they set up the steel workers organizing committee. And John L. Lewis sent three guys in here to set it up. And when he come back and asked me to take him again, I didn't want to go because he wasn't doing nothing. And uh, so he kept working. I went over. What it was then, he didn't want me to go down and meet Nick Fontaine. They were sitting up the office to get rid of the organizer steel. Okay, that's good. But, I, but can you go back and tell me that, that what they did was set up the CIO which then set up the Steel Workers Organizing Committee, right? John L. Lewis left. Let's stop for a second. John L. Lewis left, and they organized the CIO, and then the CIO organized the Steel Workers Organizing Committee. Mm -mm. That, huh? Mm -mm. That's not the way you remember it. Mm -mm. Okay. If that's not, if that's no, not the way let me, you... let, me, let me talk to you all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, you see, the, the Steel Workers Organizing Committee was first to come in. After the... Ultra macro, take four. Mark. Oh, the reason the Malcolm made it didn't work so because. Ready, I'm sorry. Because. You ready, David? I'm Michael. Yeah, go ahead. Now. Uh, the reason the Malcolm made it didn't work was because, as I said before, everybody was afraid. Uh, at that time, when they did have the little meetings, the one that did have them, they had to have secret meetings back in that time because they were afraid they would be fired. And that's the reason why it didn't work. 
and guys were scared. For 1919, uh, they, 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 they had such a time, so everybody was afraid. They just naturally was afraid. And you, as I said, 1014 just happened to have a little nuclear, about six or seven guys, and that was all. Now, what happened when the CIO came in? You mean the Committee for Industrial Organization? Yes, sir. Well, it, nothing happened. It just, just nothing no more than happened. Just had an organization then. You had all the organization. You had the international. You had the automobile workers, ladies' garment workers, and uh, well, the United Mine workers naturally, because they was the one that put up the money to organize the thing. John L. Lewis. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talked again earlier. You told me about Henry Johnson. Well, Henry Johnson, I don't know. He come in there just before they got started. He come from somewhere, I don't know, but he was a Texan. Uh, at that time, the communists was was trying to organize. And the fact of it is the communists was the one that actually was pushing to organize steel. Uh, they was the one that was pushing it. They tried to have a little kind of an organization themselves, but... They weren't able to do anything. But Henry Johnson, when he come in here, they had a different lot of groups. He come in here with some kind of an insurance. They had a, the, the, the daily workers, and they had some kind of an insurance with Henry Johnson. But then when, they, when John L. Lewis sent in these uh, three guys to set up the steel workers' organizing committee, then Henry Johnson was put on the staff. And as I told you before, I think if you remember, uh, they also went and got Jack Rusak, who was a known communist, uh, off of the milk truck and put him on his staff. But Henry Johnson, I made what you want me to tell him when he when he would tell me about the union and the communists. Why uh, a lot of people was afraid. Some of the, some of the white was afraid of John because on the kind of communists they know they they figured it was you know what I what I said they kind of smelled a rat. <laughs> But Henry Johnson told me, he said, Michael, he said, I'll tell you, he said, what we have to do as blacks, we have to, uh, what we call, uh, cooperate with them to get what we want. And we have to ally with them to get what we want. He said, because after this union is built, he said, they're going to kick the communists all out. And just as he told me it happened, he told me, he says, and I'm going to die with my boots on. And I don't know what happened, but he did. He was shot. He was killed in a, sitting in his office. Now, I don't know why he told me that, but that's what happened. Everything he told me always come true. Okay. Now, can you tell me the story, you told it to me earlier, of the meeting in Pittsburgh and mm -hmm. how some blacks opposed to the, were opposed to the Union well, and why they were opposed? Well, naturally, the majority of y'all was leading blacks. It was uh, shy of the union because naturally the old AFL had never treated it just right. They always had what's called the craft system. And the only thing at that time that they could get when the carpenters workers and the bricklayers now, is what they call hard carriers. That's the only thing the black could get. And I don't know where you know what a hard carrier is. But anyway, that's where they had to tote that mortar and those bricks climbing up there, taking that mortar and bricks up to those guys just laying them bricks and things. That was what that was their job. That's all they could get, and probably making up that stuff. At that time, they didn't have a machine making them up like they do now. They had to turn that stuff, you know, with their hand. And uh, so, so that that was one of the parts uh, back in that time on that. Okay, but you were telling me why people were opposed to it, though. Yeah, yeah. Now, and we, yeah. Well, what we had to do, nationally, we thought we were going to have a strike. We didn't know whether we were going to have a strike or not. And uh, the first thing what happened, if you want me to tell you, I think, it, is uh, I had a letter from somebody, myself and Stanley Cotton and uh, Reverend Delaney, and that was in the beginning. This was in the beginning, now, see, uh, telling us about uh, there's going to be a convention, a National Negro Convention, held in Chicago. That was on about February 19, uh, that was about 19 and um, 35, maybe 35, 36, one or two. But anyway, 
So we got this letter, and I contacted Cotton, and he said, yes, I got that. I received the letter. And uh, then I said, well, what about Delaney? And I said, we'll go over and talk with Reverend Delaney and see what he said. So we went on and talked with Reverend Delaney, and he said, yes, I received a letter. And we asked him, did he know anything about this Negro organization that had been set up as a Negro Congress way back sometime? He said, yeah, he knew about it. And then he said, I said, well, what are we going to do? We're going to want us to organize a delegate to go to Chicago to this convention that's going to have. And so uh, he said, well, I'll let you know. And so he did uh, organize this convention, this uh, delegation. We met at Reverend Hawkins' church right up here on 21st and Washington up there now. And uh, so we went over there. And, uh, oh, that was a big convention. I don't know. Now, Pittsburgh, you mentioned Pittsburgh, didn't you? Yes, sir. Well, Pittsburgh, that was all later on when we really was thinking we are going to have a strike. And we had to try to get as many of the Negro leaders as possible to go along with us, you know, so we wouldn't have any trouble. And they called this conference in Pittsburgh with Philip Murray and invited in some of the Negro leaders. Now, we had, coming from Gary here, we had, from Chicago, we had Reverend Hawk, the Reverend, um, uh, well, Reverend, uh, what did I call him before? Um, Delaney? Hmm. Reverend Delaney? No, no. We had Dick, we had uh, Bishop Walls, and um, and uh, Austin, Reverend Austin. Those were the those were the two Negro leaders, preachers that went with us to and met with Philip Murray. Uh, they wanted to hear the program that Philip Murray had outlined and tell us about the union, no discrimination, and it wasn't going to be no craft union; it'd be an industrial union. Uh, no discrimination. And uh, so at that meeting, uh, we had Reverend uh, Bishop Wall, he did speak. And what he done, he got up and told, he said, he said, boys, when you go back home, see. Stop. We're out of film. You guys, we got to finish that story when we change over, okay? Mm -hmm. but this is good. Okay, well, wait a minute, before we begin. Now, you were telling me about, about Bishop Walls was making this talk mm -hmm. at, the, at, the, at the meeting in Pittsburgh. And he was saying, boys, give me a tell them what they had to do. Yeah. Okay, well, wait a minute. Walter Mack, take five. Okay. Well, I'd say it's Bishop Paul, he was the only one that I know that spoke at that meeting. He told us, he says, he told us that when we go back home, we tell our preachers, if they don't preach our, his, our gospel, he couldn't eat our bread. And that's what Bishop Wall, he made that statement. So that gave us a big boost, you know. But when we come in back home then, we set up what is called a labor committee. And the purpose of this labor committee was is to work with our Negro leaders, doctors and lawyers, and, and get them to cooperate with us, you know, make them understand our problem in the mill uh, in the union. Uh, so that was the purpose of that convention, a conference that was held in Pittsburgh with Philip Murray. Okay. Now, did this 1919 strike have anything to do with uh, some people's opposition to the Union? Yeah, because the guys was Fred. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, you, you had the mo you, most of the white guys were nasty born of Fred because, as I said before, they had got such a licking in 1919 in that track until they naturally was afraid and they, they didn't want to be fired and uh, like I told you I think the, the company set up this year company representatives plan and uh, what we call as I told you a sugar bear union and that's what we called it at that time and the company was trying to block the union because they knew that Roosevelt was pro-labor and they started that in 1933 uh, set up this year a company representative plan and each section could organize and have its own representative, have its election and elect its own representatives and that's what happened uh, in sheet and 10 and Gary Works. Well Stanley Cotton was one of our representatives uh, in the sheet and 10 and Joe Goins and Arthur Adams 
and Cleo Owens, they was representatives in a big mill in different sections, see. Uh, they had a group, different groups. And we had in the Sherman department, we had, he was a white fella, and he was what we call one of the company guys, you know. And uh, so the last time they had a big meeting, uh, they were really driving hard to try to block the union and trying to get these guys to sign this uh, contract, what they call a sliding scale. And I don't know if you know what a sliding scale is. No, no. Well, what happened, before we had a union, the company would give us a little raise. Well, they'd give us a raise like uh, this month and maybe two, three months later, if, uh, they go back, you know, up and down. Uh, that's what they wanted to do with the union. They wanted, they, that's what they wanted to sign, what is called on a sliding scale. And so S Stanley Cotton, he was the one that really was put on the big fight because all the guys was nasty born afraid. They didn't know whether they'd be fired or not. There's it, a possibility they could have been. But the only thing that I could see that really kept the company from that pressure in the heart and they did because we blacks and the Mexicans got in there, see, and that was who they betted on before breaking the strike. See, they used us before to break the strike. And we swore by this time they wasn't going to use us to break the strike before. When we broke the strike, nasty, they, then most of the blacks and the Mexicans was kicked out. They kept two or three or few around, but the most of them was kicked out, and those guys all went back. So we said that wasn't going to happen anymore, and it didn't. Okay, that's, that was in 1919. That, yeah. Now... You call it a sugar bear union. We call it a sugar bear union. Why? Well, it's sweetness, trying to sweeten us, <laughs> give you a little sugar to make you satisfied. <laughs> and what do you mean a little sweetness? How, well, you know, that's what, you know, they always try to make you believe like you're giving you something when, you, when it's nothing. Okay. I need you to tell me that all over again, but include, you know, we call it a sugar bear union because. Because? No, I need, to, I need you to tell me. <laughs> That what you called it. You have to tell me that, because again, my question's not mm -hmm. going to be on. So, well, um, it's a sugar bear union. We call it a sugar bear union, because the only thing it was doing is trying to sweeten us up, and make us believe we was getting something, we wasn't getting nothing. Uh, it's just just a sham. It's, that's not about what it all. I'm gonna tell you. I don't know. This may not need to go in at all. Go ahead. Go ahead and tell me. <laughs> No, what what I feel like now, we got the company now supposed to set up a uh, what they call a clinic here now, and and the only thing that they're doing now is trying to block the national health program, mm -hmm. and that's the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. No, we don't want. No, you don't want that in there. You want to talk about the 30s. No. Okay. Now, uh, what did the company do when they saw the organizing effort coming together? What did they do? And you had told me a story about 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 Stanley Cotton. Well, what did they do? Yeah. Well, that's what that's what they was doing then. I'm telling you, trying to block it. That's about all they did. Was, that's what they done. But they, but you see, when 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 Stanley at that time, like I said, uh, when he was at that particular meeting, when they were really trying to get him uh, to sign his contract, well, that everybody was afraid. And Stanley Cotton, he made a statement. He says, no. He says. Says Mr. Stevenson, said you can find me today or you can find me tomorrow. He said, but I won't sign. And in that, at that point, Stevenson said, we're not going to find one. And that's the thing that hoped him out when he made that pledge and statement that he wasn't going to find anyone. And that gave the guys a little more vim to go, and they didn't sign. They, they didn't sign. That's when they were trying to get them to sign the share. That's when they were trying to get the share. That's okay. right. Now. Um, Tell me the story of, about the union's plan to have a party after you got this contract. But there were some people that didn't want, didn't want it to be a mixed party. Well, what happened was then the company was still trying to do everything they could do, trying to pretend that they were going to. They set up what is called an athletic association. And this athletic association was supposed to have been mixed, you know. They supposed to have it. Then they planned to have a picnic. And when they planned to have a picnic, some of the guys of the whites, they come to the man and say, now, look, we can't have no picnic out there mix up with my wives and their wives. We, what what are we going to do? Then the company went back to some of our guys that was with them, which one guy called Arthur Gray. He was one of the leaders of that bunch. And uh, so some of our fellows found out what was happening. They went and told 
these guys, well, said, we'll have a picnic, said, but we can't have a picnic together. Uh, we'll have to have a picnic, you know, we'll be over here, and you guys be on another side over there. So some of our fellas found out what was happening, so they come and told us what was happening. And so we said, no, no, that ain't going to happen. If they're going to have a picnic, they're going to have a picnic. If they're not, they ain't going to have it. So what we did then, see, now this wasn't a union. See, then we went to the union. We went to the union and told them what was taking place. And we told them if the company get away with that, then we just was to stop. So the union then got hold to the management and raised sand and told them they wasn't going to, if they couldn't have a picnic together, they wasn't going to have none at all. And so that's what happened. They blocked it. They didn't have a picnic because they wanted to have it separate. And so we got over to the union and told them, no, that couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. They never had it, huh? And now, another part, maybe what you might have heard me say, because I don't know what I told you, but here, when we had different section in our meeting, and uh, the guys wanted to have a, a, a party there, so some of the white fellas told some of the guys, said, look, said, we can't have them. Father said, what are we going to do? We're going to have the floor. So we got to put a rope down between here. <laughs> I told him, hell no, ain't nobody going to put no damn rope down through here. I said, no, this is, this is CIO, this is United Steel Workers of America. I said, there ain't going to be no rope, no discrimination. So they didn't put the rope. They had to the picnic, too. We had to party. But now, were there always internal racial tensions within the union? Not always. You, 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 had, you, you, you had some, but I tell you, when the thing got going good, you had them, but they didn't show their head, you know. See, you, had, you always had plenty of good white folks that were ready to go along with us, but they was afraid. They'd be called nigger lovers. You know that. All of us know that. But when the communist people, just tell you like it is, they was the only people that could bring black and white together and make them understand uh, that the old rule that the English had years ago was divide and conquer. And when they made, and I tell you, I've, the best friends we had, when they made a lot of the Southern whites understand what was happening, they was with us 100 percent, more so than some of the Northern ones. Now, the Memorial Day Massacre. You remember how you felt when you heard about what had happened? When? The Memorial Day Massacre over in Chicago. You want to know how I felt? Yes, sir. Well, naturally, you know, I hate to see our boys get killed. I, I hate to see that, you know, naturally. And uh, so that's about the only thing I can say, how I felt. I, you know. Before, you said, you told me that you hated it, but it was part of the struggle. Hmm? Before, when we talked before, you said you hated to see what happened, but it was just part of the struggle. Well, it is part of so the struggle. Can you, can you, can you give me... Talk to me about that, the, sort of the same way? Well, yeah. See, what what happened was, now, we wasn't supposed to go over to this place from Gary because they suspected trouble. And they didn't want to have anybody over there from that wasn't in that department over there because they, we would have been considered as outsiders. So they didn't want us over there. But we had a little fellow called Ted Vaughn, and he was a foxy little guy. And uh, so he come by uh, looking for me to go over there, and he went by looking for cotton. Neither one of us was at home. But he went on over there anyhow himself. And uh, naturally, that's when the trouble started. And uh, We got a film. What number is this? Last year. You finished telling me about the Memorial Day Massacre, how you felt when you heard about it, but you understood that sacrifices had to be made. Well, that's it was a sad thing when we lose 10 men. And uh, so it just, just wasn't pleasant at all. And uh, we had some of our women got beat up. Uh, Ted Vaughn, that just got it out to you about, he almost got shot. But he was running around and he didn't know what was happening. He thought it was firecrackers at first. And he said when he looked down and seen them, some of them guys bleeding, then he'd taken off. But it, it just was a sad thing. You know, naturally we hate to see that. But uh, it's just one of those things. And uh, that have happened, that have happened before. And, uh, you know, the company used to, when they had in power, they turned the 
the guns on you. And that's what happened. With that. But we was we was blessing U.S. Steel, though we didn't have to go through that. That is what they call little steel. Um, you didn't know about Fannie Bitten, didn't you? You didn't. Okay, <laughs> Phil Murray. What can? What do you remember? What are your impressions of Phil Murray? Well, Phil Murray was just a fine labor man. He was really good, and, and he'd come here and spoke with us any number of times. I met with Phil Murray several times, and uh, for facts, we had him some of our Negro meetings. He come here and spoke with us. And uh, so he was just a wonderful guy. He was just a real good labor man. And, uh, and Phil Murray, did he do any things to help bring the races together? Well, I'm satisfied he did. He was he was he was a, he was the head of the steel workers organizing committee. So he had to. Uh, he had to do something to bring it together. Can you think of anything specifically that you remember? Oh, not just direct, no. Okay. Uh, FDR, can you tell me what FDR meant to your organizing effort? Uh, FDR meant the whole thing to us. He was the one that says, organize. And that's one thing that made the guys really go to work and do the job. Because he was in our corner, as I said before. National Steel Corporation knew he was pro labor in the beginning, and that's when they'd done everything they could do to try to block it. So FDR was, he just really was okay. And uh, during, during some of the Depression times, you know, what I like about it, and when he was president, I had one guy that uh, uh, have, was having trouble uh, with getting relief here with the Mayor Grayswell, with the township trustee. And he wrote President Roosevelt, and President Roosevelt wrote him back and told him to take that letter and take it back over here to his trustee. And he come by and got me to go with him. And I went over there with him. And when he walked in, this woman, she went to try to tell him about, what can you want to write, Mr. Roosevelt? And he says, well, if that's what you want, I'll go start it out. She says, well, come back, come back, don't bother. Yeah, that's one thing that he did. And I don't know if you remember that time when, the, when they take the man's mule, the Negro's mule down south. Well, yeah, he's, he's taking his, you know, what they call breaking you up, you know, they, you know, he, uh, his mortgage, his mule, and so when he didn't make nothing, they'd taken his mule away from him. So he wrote President Roosevelt, and Roosevelt wrote back to him and got his mule back. <laughs> you didn't know that? No, and he got his mules back, huh? Yeah, he got his mule back. Okay, two more <laughs> questions. What about the Union, okay? Are you most proud of when you think back on it? What, what, makes what, you what am I proud of? I'm proud because of one thing that they did for us. We was able to be recognized as we had never been before, especially black. We got more out of it, I'd say, than white because we we was way down on the totem pole. We we didn't get anything. Now, well, what the union have done for us today, even today. Uh, through the, through the company. The company said they couldn't do this, couldn't do it. Now what's happening? He plays our Blue Cross Blue Shield first. Okay, we don't want to talk about the data. We got to keep them in the 30s. Okay? Yeah. And were you surprised when the union got the contract out of U.S. Steel without a strike? Well, we was we were surprised that it happened like it did. Yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't. Tell me what you remember about how it happened. How well, what happened? Well, what happened? How I found out about it was Henry Johnson, the guy I told you about. I come in one evening from work, and he had left word with my wife to tell me to go by and pick up his wife, and come and meet him in Chicago, and so we did. I picked up his wife in his car and went and met him in Chicago. Well, when we met him over there. I don't know where it was at now, but anyhow, we drove up and was sitting on, in the car on the streets, and he come out. And he said to me, he says, I, I understand, he said, we have come to an agreement, the recognition of the union. And I said, yeah. And uh, he said, well, I'm going to find out. I said, well, how are you going to find out? He said, I'm going to, I'm going to contact John L. Lewis. And so he left and went and contacted John L. Lewis and come back and told him it was a fax. And 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 then everything was okay. They had made it, had come to an agreement to recognition of the union. How did you feel when you found? Well, naturally, you, you know it felt better because we didn't have to strike. <laughs> we didn't have to strike, and naturally we was happy. And that was in 1930s, 
36, uh, or in the, well, that about in the fall sometime. But anyway, in 1937, that is when we got our, our buttons. In April 1937, we got our big green buttons, the recognition of the union, put our buttons on. And uh, so we was happy. Okay, let's stop. How much we got, Mike? We close to the end. We have four minutes. I mean, it's okay. Sit back. Sit back this will be uh, Walter Mack for okay. take eight. Tell me about Can the rally. One second, please. Hold on. Second. More spins. Okay. Tell me. Oh, yeah, I, I was I was at that, but of course you know the sort of field is a large place, and uh, Master, he was right out in the middle of that field. You know they had him in some kind of a truck or car or something other, you know, and you could see him good, real nice, if this is clear, and. Uh, but when they were finished, I happened to be sitting right down on the low edge of the, you know, you go step go way up, and I happened to was down low there, and he come right by, and I got a good view at him, really good look at him. Now, do you remember what the day was like? I mean, was the crowd excited? Was it a sunny day? Just describe to me what the day was like and how you felt and why you were there. Well, we were all happy. We were all glad to be there. And naturally, we, we had a parade. We left Gary. <clears throat> we left Gary that evening. Uh, with a parade and went on through East Chicago and through Hammond Whiting and picked up guys and went on into this big meeting. Yeah, that's, that's so nice. We was all, yeah. Um, but how do you feel? Do you remember whether it was a sunny day, whether there was kids all Well, it was over? night. It was night. It was night. It was, night. It, was, it, was, it was a pleasant night. It, yeah. Do you remember anything in particular that President Roosevelt said when he spoke? Not direct, particular. I can't remember what he said now. Mm -hmm. No, not direct. Mm -hmm. But I mean, can you remember anything about it? About any kind of detail you can tell me about the meeting that you can remember? I just remember we was there, <laughs> <laughs> and and it was something to be there to see the president. Uh, you know, that's a wonderful thing just of itself if you can see the president. Mm -hmm. And I was able to be there to see the president. And did it have special meaning to you, the fact that he was so supportive of labor? Yeah, nasty. Let me ask you one more question. You remember the Wagner Act? Remember when that oh, was passed? Yes, I know when it passed. Tell me what you remember about when the Wagner Act was passed, <laughs> what you all did, how you felt, what you were talking about. Well, nasty. see, the Wagner Act was one that helped us out. It gave us more uh, security. From the Wagner Act, it'd give us more security of organizing and working. And that's one thing, yeah. Yeah. Now, do you guys remember, did you remember talking about the Wagner Act before it passed, or did you have a party the night it passed, or what? It passed and you said, no, we can Well, last we had a lot of meetings back at that time, and I, I can't tell you exactly what was said. But we all know about it, and we have discussed the problem many times. I'm satisfied in our meeting because we had meetings regular then at that time. Yeah. Okay. I don't have any more questions. Do you have anything else you want to tell me you feel like I should know? Um, you want to stop and think about it? Yeah. Stop. You can think about it. Think about it. You can tell me anything you want to. This is your two minutes. Okay? Just talk. Just tell that to me about how important it is for people to come together, work together, and then that way you can accomplish things. Walter Mack will take nine. Okay. Ready? Okay. Well, yeah, you, you always do more things together. You've always heard the old story saying, together we stand and divided we fall. And so uh, it was just a pleasure when we could understand each other and work together. And, and as I said before, uh, we, we, we could, uh, well, it just made it better when we could organize. And, and because back at that time, you had a lot of problem with the company. And uh, so it was just wonderful, just wonderful. Tell me about the, how the top people used to try to divide, mm -hmm. how the top people tried to divide. 
You had said something about that. Well, yes. Uh, as I said, the, the old English slogan was divide and conquer. And uh, that was a slogan, and it was a fax. Uh, you, you, you've had, uh, i tell you what I have seen, was like some whites, they would tell you, if some other white guy come along, they well, you know, good. When they go right back over to the white and tell them the same thing about the black. Now that have happened any number of times. And some people take on all that kind of stuff. Thank you. We, Thank you. We just rolled out of film. We just ran out. But we got it.